Um, right, so it's not a red fox. So we have the black on the on the back of the tail, as opposed to um, uh, black on the tip and other morphologies. So this is a this is an, a, an adult uh, gray fox. I feel a little, little bit slightly younger, slightly younger, a little, little bit of a juvenile. Uh, so this um, so this individual uh, this is a gray fox. We have two foxes in Ventura County, in our part of the world. We have two foxes, right? So the, the kind the, the, the two foxes we'll see. We have the island fox also. So theoretically, we're we're working on. Um, uh, cultivating more island foxes, so theoretically an island fox can get up, but an island fox is going to be about about half or so this size, pretty much smaller. So um, the two foxes we have here are our gray fox, California gray fox, and red fox. So that red fox is an introduced species. Um, uh, you know, both fox-like, but they're quite different. And one of the, the best diagnostic is this tail. So see how our, our gray fox has has sort of this, this regular pattern of, of what we call it goody fur, and then it's got this black line. The the red foxes have a have a more of a, a, a tip, a colored banded tip of the um, thing. So the, this is obviously a, a gray fox. Um, so this is our native one. This is one we want more of, right? If we had a, it always sucks when anybody gets killed by a road, by a car. But if it was a red fox, like, eh. Um, but this is this is a bummer. So this is a female. We can tell she has nipples, right? So she. Um, probably was was nursing um, sometime relatively recently um, but this is this is a this, this is an adult size so you can see so this so this individual is you know about like sort of a really big cat size right? it's a little, little house cat kind of thing um, so uh, I saw this um, last night at 10 30 on the on Petrero right, right outside of school basically well, a little bit about a mile from school but, but on the road surrounding school um, and it was very cold last night, and so when I came down this morning, she was still there. She was in the median of the of the um, the road. So a lot of times when critters are in the in like the main lane, cars just kind of move them and they get smushed. And as you guys probably know, they're hard to identify, right? They're, they're really smushed. Um, but this is this is a um, uh, because it's so cold. Uh, this is a good sample um, that that we could do all kinds of work with. So we can. Um, uh, so, so picking up dead animals, you need a collecting permit, right? A, a scientific collecting permit. But, but, but assuming you have that and it's not an endangered species, right? There's all kinds of stuff we can learn from this. So one, we can um, uh, loan this to our friends at the Park Service who are working on mountain lion um, uh, uh, dynamics and, and, and fragmentation, all that kind of good stuff. One of the big questions we have is how much secondary rodenticide poisoning are getting into these critters, right? So this is coming in from uh, from uh, 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 people that are worried about rats and mice and things of that nature. And so way back when we used this very, what we call the first generation of endocides, which some of you if, you, have, if you have blood issues or if you have clotting issues, you might be taking some of this stuff, warfarin and these other blood thinners. Essentially the first generation of poison, of poison would make these vertebrates bleed to death, essentially. Um, and but but a lot of the rodents we're trying to deal with have such a quick generation time they very quickly develop resistance to it. And so and so um, we we developed this current group of poisons. Conservation biologists developed the current group of poisons um, developed by the, our friends in New Zealand primarily who were interested in poisoning rats on small islands. So they wanted to get rid of these rats so they could reintroduce the natives. And it was really really effective. So effective that the pesticide industry said. Hey, uh, uh, well, let's use that. And so now you can buy these second generation rodenticide poisons in Home Depot, in Lowe's, in any place else, right? And, and they're really powerful. They're a fantastic tool. It's great that we have these tools, but they should be used selectively. And one of the big conservation challenges we see is that these are not used selectively. So you can, you can go to Home Depot or, or whatever the store is. Don't mean to be tagged Home Depot. You can go to whatever the local hardware store is and buy this stuff and just throw it around your house, right? That's the issue. The issue again isn't the isn't the the fact that we have something; it's how we're applying the technology. And so, so in this case, we put this out to kill the rats or, or other critters, and that's great, and it kills them. And then they that 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 poison stays active in their in their body tissue. So then, when the hawk, when the mountain lion, when the fox, when the whoever comes and attacks them, then they start to build that up, right? And so then that that's been a huge problem with a lot of our meso predators and. and larger predators here in and around Ventura County 
are these second generation rodenticides. So what we can do is we can give this carcass now to our friends in the park service and they can, they can take some blood samples or some liver sample, samples and they can look at the concentration. This is really important because obviously when we find dead individuals that, that have too much of this poison, we know that killed them. But we also, just like with your roadkill surveys, where we're, we're writing down the zeros as well, right? You guys, we didn't see any roadkill. Awesome, right? That's important to get the rate. It's important to get to understand. So we also want to understand in, in Joe Blow animal, right? What, what's their concentration? Clearly some animals are, are, are harmed by the second generation pet, uh, rodenticide, but, but is everybody harmed or what's the deal? So that's really helpful. Then we can do all kinds, of, we can get all kinds of other things. So again, not wanting to waste this death, right? So we can take uh, clippings of fur or again, uh, better even like blood or tissue samples to look at um, genetic structure. So this one individual ain't gonna help us, but over time, if we collect these individuals, we can start to get, uh, build up a, an idea of the population, diver the genetic diversity of this critter, get some sense of overall population size, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, we can use this, this, this individual to look at other things, like microplastics, right? So we can cut out the, we can cut out the, um, uh, the digestive tract, and we can throw it through our machines, our, 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 our chemical fingerprinting machines, and we can determine um, what, the, what the concentration of different um, substances are in the digestive tract, which this individual might have ingested, right, intentionally or unintentionally. And then, of course, lastly, we have, we can use the skin, right? A lot of times, when you, as you guys know, when you're doing your roadkill surveys, Everything is smushed in its blah. But this is fortunately a very nice example in that we could use it as a teaching skin or whatever. So it's horrible this poor critter was killed, but um, at least we can get some value out of it, right? So um, so this is a, a gray fox. Um, what else do I want to say? Okay, the other thing, the last thing to say is, so this was, we know this was, I saw it killed last night. So, I, so it's been about, it's been dead for at least, you know, call it 10 hours probably, right? It's been very cold out. The first thing that'll happen is a critter will be hit and then if we pick them up, they'll be they'll be um, floppy, right? Because they just got killed, right? Right. So, uh, so you know, kind of floppy. Then what's going to happen is the all the um, uh, all their their muscle signaling compounds, acetylcholine, and all these things are going to uh, explode, and then they're going to get stiff. So it's so it's like they're squeezing all their muscles, right? We call that rigor mortis, right? So that's going to set in. So then after a little bit, then they're going to be like uh, really stiff. And then over the course of several hours, that is good, that those compounds will dissipate and the squeezing of the muscles will relax and they'll go back to a relaxed state. Other indications of how old the kill is, again, assuming the critter is intact, would be when we start to see scavengers. So insects or, or crows or something of that nature would come and start to, to pick them apart. And then, and then at that point, it just gets to be, you know, where we near a bunch of crows or far away crows. So, so with a couple clues, you can tell if it's a relatively fresh kill, meaning the last few hours, um, or maybe the last day or so, and then afterwards it just gets to be, to be hard to, to know. So this is a California gray fox. Uh, questions? Okay. All right. Well, there you go. So there's